So, I cracked open a few fossils um, the other day, uh, when the weather was nice, uh, today it's not. Uh, we've got the next storm coming through, Storm Garrett, which will be good for fossil hunting again at the weekend, hopefully. Uh, but I had a request for some science, um, because dark splitting, although, yeah, it's nice eye candy, what does it mean? What's it all about? Um, and, yeah, I like my science, so always happy to oblige. Right, I'm going to split some ammonites. So we've got a Dactyliosaurus nodule. You can just about see the ribs there. Let's see if it'll split. Where shall we bash it? About there. Do you reckon? Is it gonna is it gonna work? Or is it gonna splat me full of muck? Oh, it's got a split. Oh. Ah, perfect. So I uh, try and explain a little bit more about uh, how things preserve. So there's three broad um, types of uh, preservation for fossils. There is exceptional preservation, which is extremely rare, and that's where the soft parts of the uh, fossil are preserved. Um, you, there's very rare instances of the internal parts of ammonites that have been preserved, that have been found over the last few years, uh, which is how we know they are uh, a type of squid. Um, but yeah, very rare to find that. Um, the next one is um, compression uh, or carbonisation, and that's usually where the squashels, uh, the, the fossils are, the squashels, the fossils are squashed flat, um, usually under high pressure. Um, quite often this is how we find plant fossils um, and then the last one is replacement um, and that's where the, the original parts of the organism uh, have dissolved away either fully or partially to be replaced with other uh, minerals that are present in the environment at the time. So fossils can preserve in a number of different um, ways as I've explained um, the ones at the Yorkshire coast generally um, have a good uh, amount of pyrite. In fact, pyrite's usually on the shell, and then calcite is usually the internal um, structures. Um, but fossils can actually preserve in lots of other different compounds as well. So, uh, camasite, which is a, a green colour, limonite, which is normally a sort of yellowy colour, siderite, which is red. Um, uh, and even phosphatic foss fossilization. So um, in Yorkshire, if you go to uh, Speton, quite often the uh, the ammonites are quite black, and that's uh, phosphatic fossilization. So it's phosphates where um, the original material has been re replaced by calcium phosphate. Uh, as I said before, the uh, the ammonites um, uh, from Yorkshire generally the ones you see, which are the dax and the the common. Uh, the commonest fossil um, they are preserved in this pyrite shell so if we take this off this one's a hildy but it's quite good so as you can see I've only just split this yesterday so I picked this one up at Raver Scar it's got a bit of a funny bend in it so I'm not sure if this is going to be our first fail so it's hildoceros they do tend to split but it can be a little bit sticky uh, from Raven Scar so yeah, I'm going to give it a tap and see what happens. So I think from that side, I think, might be our first fail. Oh, we've got a crack. I think we've gone through the body chamber. But it might split all right. Oh, no, actually, perfect. Look at that. And you can see there that there's a lovely shiny gold colour. And that is um, the pyrite, or fool's gold, um, which is iron sulphide. Usually, um, when it's split open, it's very shiny. It can be silver or gold, um, but that does dull over time as the oxygen gets to it, um, and it does then go a bit of a darker colour. Um, that iron pyrite is just the covering. So usually when we split these fossils, What's happening is the shell is coming away from the internal cast and that is the weak point which is why the fossils split. So usually the shell is on this side 
and this is the internal cast very rarely do we get one of these which has the entire shell on uh, and usually it's a nice brown shell so the shell's the weak point which is why the fossils split and that pyrite uh, has to have very specific conditions in which to form so it tells us a lot about how the fossil or the, the animal before it was a fossil um, was uh, preserved what the ocean conditions were like so uh, for pyrite we need very low oxygen in the water or rapid deposition so it could be a case of the um, fossil has been buried very quickly um, or it could be that the uh, oceans at the time are anoxic there could have been a mass die off in which case the oxygen in the water may have lowered resulting in a mass death of these ammonites um, either way we need low oxygen uh, secondly we need a lot of iron because we need iron for iron sulfide which is what fool's gold is and then we also need uh, microbes in the form of bacteria in fact we need sulfate reducing bacteria which can pr uh, metabolize sulfate into sulfide um, that allows the iron sulfide then to uh, permeate into the organism and replace the minerals with pyrite so two good ones so far this is the third are we going to get three in a row there's a bit of a crusty dactylioceros in this uh, nodule came out of the cliffs so let's see if we can split this one into a nice ammonite because this could have a nice center so we'll try it this way i think split. Is it three out of three? Here it goes. Oh, 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 oh it is. There we go, three out of three. Um, pyrite does decay if you're not careful, so with, with oxygen, so it will, will start rusting. Um, ones in Yorkshire tend to be quite stable, but um, again, you want to keep them in a, a low, uh, not, I won't say oxygen environment, but a low moisture environment because they will ultimately uh, decay if they get wet. So if we look at these fossils more closely, when we're splitting these fossils, there's a reason they split like they do. They don't always split very well. In fact, some are quite difficult. So for instance, this one, I know this fossil wouldn't split because it's preserved in Whitby mudstone. Um, this was probably preserved in mud and it probably was a higher oxygen content and it's made it much more stickier so they can be um, prepared using air tools um, but ten generally there's not as much separation between these and the pyrite ones the pyrite ones do split really well and the reason is that there's usually a weak spot um, between the shell and the internal cast of the ammonite so what we're looking at on this side is actually the internal cast of the ammonite so this is what it would look like underneath the shell and the shell has come away with this part of the negative so quite often they, they would look slightly different um, if you could have the shell on occasionally these can be prepared with all the shell intact and you will find that they do look different uh, although not not hugely different but they do look different um, a good one to look at even though this is it is a DAC but it's an older DAC as you can see on here areas where the shell has gone and that's the internal cast and then you can see on there areas where the shell have remained right three out of three we're doing well so got this one another nice back nodule yeah, it's got a little crack running around it so it looks like it might split but whether that's a good split or not or a bad split remains to be seen so i don't think we'll need to tap this one very much i think just a gentle Very gentle tapping. Ooh, I'm not quite sure about this one. I'm not quite sure about this one at all. What do you think? Is it going to be? Ooh. Ooh. It's done the middle, but it's not, it's not bad. the best. Yeah, it's certainly got some character. So these are about 183 million years old 
um, from the Grey Shales. Uh, and there was definitely a lot of these um, that uh, appeared uh, all uh, at the same time. Certainly in Yorkshire these are quite a common ammonite when you find the right layer and they're dropping out. Usually 100 plus ribs per whirl. So yeah, quite easily recognisable. They then evolved to um, semislatums, and this is a this is a different um, preservation. This is from Lincolnshire. Um, and these are semislatum um, dactyliosaurus. Again, slightly le less ribby. They seem to get a little bit bigger than the ten eucostatums. Um, but again, lovely specimens. These are slightly younger. So after that we went into the jet rock and the dacks seem to disappear a little bit although they're still there. You get the dactyliosaurus grass isles which are really small ones which you get with the harposaurus. Um, but then it's really after that into the bifron subzone where we start getting what you would commonly see as dacks on the Whitby coast. Right last split another dac nodule it's quite worn on the outer world is this one but again it can be nice inside. Let's see if we can split this one. It's going well so far. Far, far, far. I'm going to do it this way right now. I'm going to do it that way around. This might be a bit soft, this one. It might be a bit soft. There goes. Oh, there we go. Again, not bad at all. Five for five. Not bad at all. And again, you can get these all shapes and sizes. Some are particularly thick, like these two. Especially that one. Very chunky, is that? Some are quite slender. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot of variation. I think there was... Um, I think Buckman was one of the early Ammonite study peoples, um, scientists, that's what the word I was thinking of, um, classified around 27 species of Dactyliosaurus in the Bifron zones. Um, but again, a lot of that could just be the variation of the species. There are two main common varieties that you find, which is this one and this one. So this one is commune. You can tell by the rounded venter. So you can see it's more rounded, whereas on this one it's more arched or vaulted. So rather than rather than going round, it's going up and round. That's usually the easiest way of, of looking at it. The ribs can be different as well, um, but that's that's usually the quickest way of, of working out which one it is. Still, many hours of looking at some of these ammonites trying to figure out which one they are uh, because the differences are quite subtle. Hit it like you mean it. Ooh, get in there. Just on top there, yeah. And again. Ooh, turn it over. Alright, try not to hit my fingers, please. I'll hold it. Stop. Don't hit your fingers. Alright, hit it hard. And again. Ooh, I think it's cracking. Alright, gently. Well, not too gently, but you know. Oh, you got your crack. All right, reveal. Oh, look at that. Perfect. You better keep that one. That's brilliant. Look at that. That's all the way around to the middle. Again, you can find these things all over the place. They were very common ammonites. I say this one is from Lincolnshire. This one I collected recently at Epe on the south coast. Again, another Dactyliosaurus. These are from um, Ilminster, um, but you can also collect dax um, in Germany. Um, it's quite a famous site in Germany where, uh, again, you get rafts of orange dax and hildes, very similar to this. Um, and again, um, they look very beautiful when they're uh, prepared up. So they were very common ammonite in um what was probably the a, a numerous seas across the world, uh, hence we find them 
uh, all over the place. And then what was the fate of the Dactylioceros? Well, all they did were evolve, so obviously species die out um, and usually evolve into other species. So um, it's thought that uh, the Dax eventually evolved into the Peronoceros um, and also Zugodactylites as well. So again, some different Peronoceros and these are the little spiky ones. Um, so these appear near the top of the Bifron subzone. So they're a little bit younger than, than these Dax. And again, some got fatter, some got thinner, but they all ended up with some little spikes. Right, that's the science done. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments, but now back to splitting some ammonites. Probably the best pop of the lot. Nice. Lovely uh, Dactylioceros split. That's a lovely Posneg, is that? So yeah, Happy New Year everybody. Don't forget to like and subscribe.